Today I want to share with you how to get my free 36 page traditional foods pantry list. It's finally here. Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient dense foods like bone broth, ferment, sourdough and more. So if you enjoy learning about those things consider subscribing to my channel and don't forget to click on the little notification bell below that'll let you know every time I upload a new video. Well I've been working on this pantry list for a while now and I am so happy to be able to share it with you. Now if you're on my email list you'll probably receive an email from me over the next couple of hours uh, that'll have a link where uh, and if you click on that link it'll tell you how you can download this. If you're not on my email list don't worry. If you open up the description under this video you'll see a link there and you know it'll say like pantry list or something like that and click on that link and that'll take you over to my website and it'll tell you, it'll give you the instructions for how to download this pantry list. Now I just want to mention because I know some of you have shared this with me in the past that you're never quite sure how what I mean when I say the description or how to open the description. Underneath this video uh, you'll see the title of the video and then under the title you'll see a few sentences that are starting to talk about the video and then under those sentences you should see the word show more. If you click on show more that'll open up the whole description and you'll have everything that you need. Now it it does vary depending on what device you're on. You may, some of you have told me you don't see the word show more. If that's the case, just click on the title and that'll open up the description. Or if you look to the far right of the title, there's a little upside down triangle. And if you click on that, that'll also open up the description. So hopefully that'll be easy for you to find now. And I know some of you have asked me why I don't put more links in comments and the only reason is if I put a link in the comment section that takes you out of YouTube it may or may not appear. Uh, it's unpredictable but I know that if it's in the description you'll always have it there. Now I'll show you how I'm going to put my pantry list together. What I did was just got an old, I got an old binder here from my homeschooling days and I printed out my list and then I'm going to take my cover and I'm just going to slide this down right in the front here. I love these binders that have these uh, plastic covers on the front. So that's what I'm showing you in the thumbnail. I'm just putting it in a binder. And then I just hole punched my, uh, my list and then I'm going to go ahead and put it into my binder. Now I'm actually going to print out a couple of copies of this and I'll talk about that. Uh, what I'm going to do with this copy is probably keep this in my extended pantry and I'll explain why in a minute. But then what I'm going to do is I'm going to print out another copy of this pantry list and I'm going to put this in my, this is my, this is a behemoth. <laughs> I'm going to put this in my kitchen journal. This, and I'm going to do a video on this probably for next week. Uh, I, some people love doing planners. I love doing kitchen journals. <laughs> but uh, I've made a section in here for where I'm going to put in this pantry list. I'm going to put it right in here in, into my kitchen journal. This is something I always have handy on my desk here in my kitchen. has everything that I need uh, to know about whatever, <laughs> whatever I'm cooking or grocery lists, you know, all pieces of information that I want to always have at the ready so I don't have to like relook something online or try to find it in a cookbook or something like that. I just keep it here in my kitchen journal. But we'll talk about this maybe next week. However, getting back to the pantry list, what I've done is, and I'll overlay some pictures as I'm talking so you can see what it is that I'm um, explaining, but in the beginning, okay, so I've got the table of contents and then I've got, um, it goes up to page nine where I'm just kind of going over, it's like an introduction, where I talk about what I mean when I use the term pantry. Those of you who've been with me for a while know that uh, I call it the four corners pantry because I'm talking about your working pantry or your main pantry, the closet or cupboard that you have in your kitchen that you access a lot during the day or whenever you're cooking. Uh, also included in the, in the four corners pantry is your fridge and your freezer and your extended pantry. 
And if you're not familiar, when I use the terminology extended pantry, what I'm talking about is where you keep your backup supplies. Uh, they could be long-term storage, you could have some of your survival pantry items in there, and also things you know you find on sale and you want to stock up on. So it's really kind of a, a multi-purpose uh, place. And in my case, it's just a little closet under my stairway. Some people have whole rooms dedicated to it, which I think is fabulous. Uh, but uh, that's so this pantry list covers the four corners pantry because as you see how I call it how to stock your essential traditional foods four corners pantry and by no means is this exhaustive you may I, I have a lot of stuff in here as I said it is 36 pages long and some things you may not buy and uh, there may be something uh, on my list that's missing that you really like so what I've done is leave I've left space where you can fill in you know whatever particular specialty item you may like to buy that I've not added here but in any event, so after you get through, you know, here I'm talking about, you know, all the Four Corners Pantry, the extended, you know, what about organic, you know, and again, those of you who have been with me for a while know that I'm not a fuss budget and I'm not going to preach to you. You buy what's in your budget. As long as it's real whole food and you're cooking it, uh, it's a lot better than fast food. So if it's organic, great. Yeah, it's perfect. You know, uh, I buy a lot of stuff that's just local and I don't really worry whether it's organic or not, because I think local, uh, it, was, it didn't have to be transported as far to me. And I'm blessed to live in Texas because we have a lot of, you know, I consider the whole state of Texas local. Uh, we grow a lot of stuff here and raise a lot of, you know, cattle and chickens and, you know, pork and also a lot of things I can get locally, which is, which is wonderful. Uh, so I don't worry, you know, if it's not organic. Uh, and again, if you're buying things at the grocery store, and organic just isn't in your budget. I think eating fruits and vegetables and a real chicken and and foods like that are as much better for you than fast food. So don't stress, you know. And again, this list may initially seem almost like a little overwhelming because there's so many things listed here, but I wanted to try to be at least for me as thorough as possible. But I don't want you to feel you have to like rush out and stock your pantry with all of this stuff. Some of it you may not like. Some of it, you know, it, may, it takes time. Uh, I personally feel that when you are stocking your traditional foods pantry, you should plan at least this taking you a year. Because not only are you going to start you know, eliminating foods that you're used to buying, processed foods, packaged foods, you know, as I've shared with you, what my mother called prepared foods. As you're phasing those out and you're bringing in real foods, uh, you have to find what you like. You know, what type of olive oil do you like? What type of butter do you like? You know, what do you like the taste of? Um, so I think that that's important uh, to not rush. Stock your traditional foods pantry slowly. Uh, you, you, will, you will be much happier uh, with the foods that you incorporate uh, into your traditional foods pantry and you'll, uh, because they'll be eaten by you and your friends and your family because you like them and you've uh, maybe through a little trial and error have found those particular uh, brands or products, whatever the case may be, that you like. And that I think is very important. But getting back uh, to the whole list here, what I've done is this one is animal and fish proteins, and I've broken it. In, I've broken the list into essential and then optional. And when I say essential, these are things I consider, for the most part, are essential to a traditional foods kitchen. But again, like I said, you don't need to rush out and make sure that you have everything that I consider essential. Um, I I felt when I was doing this that what was essential, you know to most of us. And when I say essential, again, as I you know, mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, stock these things slowly. And once you have your essential pantry built up to where you like it, then you can start considering and looking at some of those items that I list as optional. And again, it's whether you like them or not. So that's you know, always a, a, a good uh, barometer, so to speak, to determine what you're going to be adding to your pantry. But anyway, so with the essential list, 
and this is every page will be like this. I've got a blank column here where you can put in the amount of what you have in your pantry, you know, when you do your pantry inventory. And then I've got the item, and then I've talked about where I, and this is in my humble, my humble opinion, where I think it's best to store these things. So I've got main, fridge, freezer, or extended. And then I've just blackened the dots where I felt that these were best stored and or where I store them. And then in the notes section, you have a little space you can make some notes. And where I have a video or a playlist where I show you how to cook these things or make these things homemade, uh, I've included that link. So when you download this and you have it online, you know, you can pr you know, print out your actual copy like this. But when you're having it online, you can click on any of these links and they will take you to the video, uh, as I said, where I'm showing you how to make these things or how to use them or whatever the case may be. Now, I want to mention something about the amount uh, category because you might say, oh my gosh, but well, once I write it in, you know, then, uh, you know, I've, I've, you know, used it. No, I have to print out another copy and that's a lot to print out. Don't worry about that and just use a pencil and erase it. Or if you want to do what I do, and I think I've talked to you about these pens before. These, and I'm not even quite sure how to pronounce this. I don't know if it's Frixion or Frixion, but these are made by the Pilot Company. And I have nothing to do with this company, but I love these pens. I always buy a lot of them. And you can buy them in black and in blue, I think in red. And then you can buy the multicolor pack. I love the multicolor pack because I love the purple. But what I'll do is I'll write what I, how much I have. And now you might be saying, Mary, it's pen. They're erasable. And they're not like pencils. There's no erasure that appears. I find it, it's like amazing to me. So I'll write, you know, like what, for example, six bananas. Say we were on the fruit and vegetable page and I wrote, I have six bananas. And then, you know, when it comes time to go shopping again, because that's something I didn't mention, this is great to bring to the grocery store with you because you can look at this and, and have your inventory right in front of you as well as you can have places to make notes where, uh, of things that you need to buy. Uh, but at any event, so you can just erase this and it's like brand new. It, to me, these are magic. But in any event, I just had to share it with you if you weren't familiar with them. And I, mean, I think you can buy them anywhere. Uh, I've seen them sometimes in the school section at my grocery store. But uh, if you can't find them, I'll put a link in the description below where I get them. I, I just get them on Amazon. And uh, they're, they're very reasonably priced. So I just think they're a lot of fun to have. <laughs> but in any event, getting back to uh, the pantry list. So. Uh, I've got the animal uh, and fish proteins essential. That's my ice maker. That thing's always making noise. Uh, I've got, and then I've got optional. And then we go into baking essentials and then baking optional. And then periodically throughout this, I uh, have little paragraphs of where I've written something that I share with you that I felt was important to discuss. And then I have a link to a video relating to that particular subject matter. So for example, here I have, do you need a scale to make a sourdough starter? Because I get a lot of questions about that. And so I talk a little bit about it and then I link to my complete sourdough starter guide. And just to give you a little preview of my thoughts on that, you know, if, if you've not seen my complete sourdough starter guide, I'm a firm believer that you don't need a scale. Our ancestors didn't have scale and they all seem to be able to make sourdough starter. Um, and, and this again, this is my humble opinion because I know some of you are very wedded to weighing everything and making sure that it's perfect. And I understand that completely. But I also never want the lack of equipment to stand in the way of anyone not being able to make traditional foods. This is why I 
talk a lot, and I know I talk a lot about staying within your budget, and I also talk a lot about, <coughs> excuse me, why you don't need a lot of special equipment. Because I want everyone to be on this journey with us to be able to, uh, go on that journey from a processed food kitchen to a traditional foods kitchen and not worrying about, oh, I don't have everything perfect. It's not all organic. Oh, I don't have all the best equipment in the world. You don't need it. And I give you some tricks in that video here. It's, this is, um, <laughs> Well, I'm getting to the point now. I really need my bifocals all the time. Uh, it's on page 13 of the pantry list. And I go into a lot of uh, explanation and I give you a lot of tips and tricks of how to get the water and the flour as close in weight as possible to each other with basically just a measuring cup and a spoon. So don't worry, uh, you can do this. <laughs> <laughs> it's always like the remember the chef Emeril Agassi I think years ago you know he had the show on uh, Food Network and he'd say it's not rocket science that's it it's not rocket science and here the list just continues on with beverages and you'll see on some of the pages at the bottom of the lists I've left you know a space or two where you can fill in uh, something that you really like that you know maybe I've left out uh, so, you know, you've got some space there. I've also put in some, on some pages, I've put in notes uh, where I wanted, I wanted to leave this open for either the link to the video or a playlist and also maybe to give you a little space to write your own notes. But on some pages down on the bottom, I've included some notes uh, that I felt were important to clarify uh, some points about things that are on the uh, list. But then here I've got dairy and dairy alternatives, because I know some of you have really uh, asked me a lot about you know, what my thoughts are on dairy alternatives. Uh, for those of you who uh, don't tolerate dairy or may, may be lactose intolerant, uh, so there are a lot of options for you, so that's good news. And then I've got fats and oils, again, essential and optional. Uh, fresh aromatics. Now, in fresh aromatics, I have included uh, carrots and celery. Now, yes, those are also vegetables, uh, so they're multi-purpose. But I've got them in the aromatic section because uh, not only do I use them as vegetables, I use them a lot as aromatics because they add, especially in bone broth, because bone broths from the bones uh, get a lot of collagen, which then turns into gelatin because collagen is cooked gelatin. <laughs> collagen is cooked gelatin. Gelatin is cooked collagen. <laughs> uh, so you, these bone broths are rich in collagen and rich in, or rich in gelatin and rich in um, you know, some proteins you know, because collagen is a protein. But they're not that rich in minerals. And so adding aromatics like your um, carrots and your celery and of course your onions uh, add uh, very helpful minerals. They really help boost the minerals of your bone broth. So that's why since we are talking about traditional foods, I do put the carrots and celery in that aromatics category. And then here I'm talking about uh, what are wheat berries and the different types of wheat berries. Uh, this comes up a lot because also if you can, I don't know if you can see on the camera, but I've got rye up here. I know it's not a wheat berry, but I'm very passionate about rye flour and having rye berries on hand. Uh, so I, I always like to include that when I talk about wheat berries. But in any event, I, I go over um, the ancient grains as well, the ancient wheats, you know, what is spelt, what is emmer, what is einkorn. You may, almost, you may also know emmer as farro. Um, and then what's the difference between hard white wheat and hard red wheat? Uh, now, I don't uh, have pictured here are your soft wheats, which are generally those that are milled and turned into pastry flours. However, all of that said, I do have a link there. So again, you know, whenever I put in a little discussion about something that I think is important, I have a link and you can click on that and that'll take you over to the video where I go into a very detailed discussion about all of this. And then down here I have what is Kamut because that's also a very interesting and ancient grain.
Then I've got fruits, essential and optional. I talk about here I've got some links for those of you who are interested in learning about canning. And I personally always recommend that if you're new to canning, it, water bath canning is a great place to start because it's easy and it's not as intimidating as pressure canning. And you'd be amazed at how much you can uh, can uh, when you do water bath canning. You know, a lot of people just think, oh, jams and jellies, but you can water bath can pickles, you can water bath can tomatoes, you can water bath can fruit. So there's a lot that you can do uh, to learn about canning and stock your pantry, you know, and, and keep it a little easy and less intimidating for you. Plus, the nice thing about water bath canning is you don't need anything special. Yes, I do have an electric water bath canner that my husband gave me a few years ago as a gift, which was very nice. And it's wonderful to have because that frees up my stove. But if you have a stock pot, you're good to go. Uh, that's really all you need. And you can even make, uh, you generally you have to put a rack down on the bottom of your stock pot, but you can make that with your, just uh, uh, using twist ties or anything like that to twist tie a bunch of canning lids together. And then you make a little rack. I show you how to do that in my water bath canning videos. So this is a really good, this is a water bath canning 101, these classes. And so I think that you'll like that, especially if you're interested in learning how to can uh, different types of things. Then we got grains, essential. Uh, I have a lot of links here on how to bake all different kinds of bread. And I do have a very basic sandwich bread uh, that uses yeast. You don't have to worry about sourdough. You don't have to worry about getting a special flour. This is really for the beginner who is really at the very beginning of their journey, making the transition from a processed foods kitchen to a traditional foods kitchen. And this shows you how to make a sandwich bread to replace uh, the sandwich bread in the plastic bag you may be buying at the grocery store. And that's been a very popular video. It's ve the bread is so easy to make. It's pretty much almost foolproof. And so it's perfect for the beginner. So I definitely recommend uh, checking that out if you've not had a chance to. Uh, so anyways, grains essential. And then we've got grains optional. Uh, I really, the optional list is long because I'm a firm believer that when you're just getting started with grains, go basic <laughs> and then work your way up to all of these more ancient grains and exotic grains. Uh, then we've got legumes and pulses, essential. I think that's always good to have a, a lot of those on hand, you know, beans and things like that. And then we've got some optional. I talk about why you should soak beans. And I know that's, <laughs> that's in my humble opinion and what I've learned over the years. But uh, I know everybody has different opinion on that. But I do share that with you. And I, I have a link there uh, where I show you how to, how to uh, I'm not sure, let's see what, oh, that's the one on soak, yeah. I show you how to, if you're really um, uh, industrious, I, I show you how to soak and sprout your beans to make them even more digestible. And it's actually very easy to do. It does take a few days, but it's really downtime on your part. The beans are doing all the work. Uh, then I have another video uh, where I show you uh, the way that I like to cook beans. But in any event, so, and then we're going to go to nuts and seeds. And then I talk about, uh, oh, I have a discussion here whether you should use white flour or whole grain flour. And again, I'm not preachy. I think that if you start with white flour, even if you're just making sandwich bread, it's better than buying it. And eventually, uh, you can take all-purpose flour and make it more nutritious once you get your sourdough starter going and you start baking sourdough bread. So just like uh, you can take ultra-pasteurized milk and culture it and turn it into yogurt and make it a lot more uh, nutritious, basically restoring a lot of the nutrients, in essence, that have been destroyed by the ultra-pasteurization process, you can take white all-purpose flour or bread flour and uh, turn it into sourdough and so make it you're going to make it much more nutritious and the nice thing is even if it's just all-purpose flour that you're using some yeast and making sandwich bread it's going to have less ingredients like dough conditioners and whatnot that uh, the store-bought bread is going to have and it's just going to be fresher and it's going to be hot out of the oven and there's a lot to be said for the comfort that homemade bread brings, even if it's just a simple white sandwich bread. So I just talk a little bit about that. 
And then I've got the seasonings that I think are essential. And this all, and for the most part, all the essential items that I've listed here are things you can find right at your grocery store. No specialty stores needed, no online ordering. You know, I feel very strongly about that. You know, as you know, I always talk about staying in your budget. And I try to make things very accessible that you can get at your grocery store. I, a few pages back, I had a section where I talk about how to make your own salad dressings. That's a big, I mean, boy, that's just night and day uh, in terms of flavor and nutrition. Uh, you can use a lot of your own homemade products to make your own salad dressings. You can use your homemade sour cream. And I have videos on how to do all of this. Your own homemade mayonnaise, your own homemade fermented ketchup, your own homemade fermented mustards. There's so much that you can do to replicate what you may be buying at the grocery store, but what you're going to find is what you're making is going to be fresher, tastier, and more nutritious. And so down here, uh, you don't need to buy those seasoning blends anymore. You, you can just buy the plain seasonings that's going to be less expensive, and it's going to be just that particular herb or spice. A lot of those seasoning blends, and this is often I want to add is something that brings people to wanting to make the transition from a processed foods kitchen to a traditional foods kitchen because they may have been using seasoning blends and they find it doesn't agree with them or it causes a headache. Sometimes people will say, oh, monosodium glutamate in them, you know, the MSG or things that sometimes are just labeled natural flavors. You don't really know what they are. I mean, monosodium glutamate, I think, is considered a natural flavor. But what you can do is once you stock your essential pantry with just a handful of herbs and spices and some salt and pepper, you can start making your own seasoning blends. And they're going to agree with you much more than the ones that are store-bought and potentially contain chemicals or anti-caking agents or other processed ingredients. And under optional seasonings, I talk about bouillon powders. And I have a whole video playlist that I've uh, put the link in here for you. You can make your own homemade bouillon powder. Basically, uh, like what would be the cube, but it's going to be in a bouillon cube, but it's going to be in a powdered form. And I give, you know, instructions for, you know, what the equivalent is if you're using a bouillon cube uh, at, versus your uh, homemade bouillon powder. But it is so easy to make homemade bouillon. Uh, you can take your beef broth or beef bone broth or beef stock, whatever you have, and you're going to dry it. You don't need any special equipment. If you have a dehydrator, great, but you can do it in the oven too. And it's going to dry up and it's going to be like shards. And then you just can put them in a blender, whirl them up, and you have your bouillon powder. And I show you how to do this with beef and with chicken, and also with vegetable. And all of these uh, bouillon powders, now what's interesting about the vegetable one, I show you how to make a vegetable one, which is like a moist mixture. And you can keep that in your fridge or your pantry, but then I take it one step further, and I show you how to dehydrate that. And again, you can do it right in your oven, and to make that an actual dry, shelf-stable bouillon. A vegetable bouillon and it's very easy to make so you never have to buy bouillon cubes again uh, or bouillon uh, powder you know sometimes they're sold in canisters where they are granules you don't need to buy that uh, some people like uh, those I think oh gosh I think they're called like better than bouillon because they're um, they're moist and you open the jar and you scoop things out, but those have a lot of chemicals in them. And why not just take your own beef bone broth or your own chicken bone broth, which chicken bone broth, basically all of that's free more or less, because if you buy a whole chicken and you roast it and you eat it, I show you how to make chicken bone broth with the carcass of the roast chicken. And so you're making it for pennies a jar, and you're gonna get a whole bunch of jars of chicken bone broth, and then you can take some of those and dehydrate them. Yeah, like I said, in your oven, you're just gonna spread it out on a baking sheet, a lined baking sheet, 
dry it on the lowest setting that you have in your oven and don't worry if your oven doesn't go uh, below 150 or 170 whatever the case may be it's going to work great and you're going to have your own bouillon powder so not only have you enjoyed a roast chicken dinner you've made chicken bone broth and you've made chicken bone uh, chicken bone broth powder or chicken bouillon powder now, i just think that's so fabulous because uh basically the bone broth as i said is pennies a jar and uh, your bouillon powder is pennies <laughs> a jar or you know it's, it's almost free so you really don't need to buy a lot of prepared foods you don't need to buy salad dressing you don't need to buy seasoning blends i have another video where i show you how to make a poultry seasoning it's very similar not exactly but very similar to um uh, bell's poultry seasoning you see it's common around thanksgiving time all of this stuff can be made homemade and for a fraction of the cost of buying it uh, already prepared for you. Next I go into sweeteners and I've got the essentials listed here which again I keep it very simple things that are very easy to find at the grocery store and then I've got the optional sweeteners and down here I'm talking I go into a little detail where I talk about where do forever and almost forever foods fit in. So if you've not seen that video where I talk about the top 10 forever foods, those are the ones for your extended pantry or uh, the, the survival pantry section of your extended pantry. And I'll be sure to link to that video in the description below because that's very interesting. I really, when I was researching that, I learned a lot. You don't need to buy any... Uh, pre-prepared, you know, dehydrated food and things like that, the survival foods, if it's not in your budget, or um, you can make a lot of things homemade uh, that you can put in your survival pantry. And there's a lot of very simple things you can buy for your survival pantry. So that's always good to know. Definitely, you know, if you like those um, survival foods uh, that you know can have like 25 year shelf life and whatnot that's great but it's often not in everybody's budget and you do uh, you know if you like to plan and prepare uh, for you know illness or job loss or bad weather or things like we're going through now with this uh, virus and this worldwide emergency where maybe you can't find things at the grocery store having those back not just the backup foods in your extended pantry uh, or your you know your backup stock for you know when you need to replace say your spaghetti or something in your working pantry but those foods that can go a little longer if if things are difficult for you or you're in a difficult situation and you may need a year or more of uh, your your backup food which you know is is your survival food so that's uh something that I discuss in, the, in that video. Uh, so definitely check that out. Then I got vegetables and tubers, essential and optional. And again, some notes that I wanted to highlight for you about uh, some things in the list. And then I've got vinegars. And I want to say something about vinegars. I like to make a lot of homemade vinegars. And uh, I like to make apple cider vinegar, homemade apple cider vinegar. You know, it's raw, it has the mother, you know, all of that. So it's very rich in good probiotics. Uh, but, you know, I'm generally making that when apples are in season. I try to do things very seasonally because the price of the produce is more affordable when it's actually in season. So I kind of take care, or is a little careful, I should say, in how I use my homemade apple cider vinegar because I think that's the best apple cider vinegar. Uh, but when I use some type of acid to soak my grains, for example, like we usually eat oatmeal uh, at breakfast, uh, and I take oat groats and I toast them and then I chop them up a little in the blender and then I soak them. I have a video where I show you how to do that if that's something that interests you, but you can use steel cut oats, you can use the old fashioned rolled oats, whatever the case may be, whatever is easy for you to find and whatever you like. But since I'm cooking that and it would destroy any um, good uh, bacteria in my apple cider vinegar, I'll usually buy some apple cider vinegar as well that I keep in my pantry 
and that I use for soaking things. So, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, it, it's okay to buy some things uh, if you feel in the long run you're preserving the things that you make homemade that may be uh, that the goodness of the of them being homemade could be damaged by heat so in the case of vinegar I do as I said like to have my homemade vinegars but then I also like to have some backup uh, vinegars that I buy at the store uh, then I just talk about some helpful extra pantry staples that are good to keep on hand. And then I've just got some links for how to stay in touch with me at the end. But in any event, I hope that you're going to like this. So be sure to check the description below or keep an eye out for the email. And I'd be interested in hearing what you think of this pantry list. And now, if you want to learn, if you're at the beginning of your journey and you're learning about how to transition from a traditional, from a processed foods kitchen to a traditional foods kitchen, be sure to click on this video over here where I have my Mastering the Basics cla uh, class, classes. It's 15 videos and it takes you through bone broth and sourdough and sprouting grains and more. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country Kitchen. Love and God bless.